Hi. Hey, hi. Hey, hi, hello. So we have Harry here, right? Thank hello. you. Thank you for coming. First time in Belgrade or? Second time in Belgrade. Second time in Belgrade. Okay. So tell me something. Should I be worried if I lived in the 60s? Oh, shit. You've heard about this. <laughs> yes. Has everyone else heard about this? I don't think so. <laughs> Would you like to share that with us? <laughs> oh, I guess I have to now. Don't Google my name because I share my name with a serial killer from the 60s. <laughs> There's a guy called Harry Roberts who killed police officers in England in the 1960s. Oh, wow. And the worst thing is, <laughs> the worst thing is he's still alive oh. and he's still in prison. And every few years he gets in the news because he did something else nasty while he was in prison. So the newspapers are all, Harry Roberts did this in prison. <laughs> I'm ringing my mum like, mum, it wasn't me, it was another Harry Roberts. <laughs> so yeah, don't Google me. Okay, thank you, man. Hey, thank you. Please. So yeah, it's my third party and I will cry if I want to. Um, I'll warn you, I might actually cry because this talk will be looking at the sort of the dangers, the perils, the complete minefield that is third-party performance. Uh, I'm willing to bet that every website you've ever built has used at least one, if not a handful of third parties. And we usually use third parties for convenience sake. They might provide a service that we don't have the internal skills to make ourselves, the inclination, we might just not want to build our own analytics software. Uh, we might not be able to afford to build it ourselves. It's usually cheaper to outsource that. But what ends up happening is we trade convenience for kind of safety and responsibility. We are now beginning to relinquish some control. Every third party we add to a site is a potential security vector. It's a potential performance impact. So we're beginning to trade convenience for control here. And in this talk, I want to talk about what those risks are, how to measure and discuss them, and then how to begin mitigating them. So my name is Harry. I'm a consultant performance engineer, uh, a job title I invented for myself two years ago, and it's going pretty well. Um, my advice is just invent a job title and that's the kind of work you will start getting asked to do. So just dress for the job you want. But I'm from the north of England, which goes some way to explaining the weird accent. Uh, and in my career, I've been really fortunate to work with some really wonderful, really quite amazing clients. And I normally help people like these uh, build faster, more resilient and more scalable front-end architectures. And pretty much every company on this slide has had some kind of third-party performance impact. Performance degradation that completely wasn't their fault, but still impacted them and the way they are able to operate. When I began writing a talk on third parties, my mind immediately sprang to this news story from, it's, it's quite old, it's 10 years old, but this news story has some really alarming parallels with third-party performance. It deals with parties, unexpected or unwanted visitors, and financial repercussions. Well, it's the real-life risky business. A teenager holds an alcohol-fueled party for hundreds of kids while his unsuspecting parents are on holiday. 16-year-old Corey Worthington is now facing not only the wrath of mum and dad, but a $20,000 fine from police. I spoke to him a short time ago. Corey, thanks for joining us. The only question that I can think to ask is, what were you thinking? Um, I wasn't really. Did your parents say you could have a party? Um, no. So, they didn't. why did you? Um, I don't know, it was just a get together with a couple mates at first, and then we thought we might as well just have a bit of a party, and then it sort of just got out of hand, and yeah. I fucking hate that guy. He looks annoying. Um, but the last sentence, it kind of just got out of hand. I mean, understatement of the century, but also it made me think there are more parallels still. Most third-party performance issues are simply things that got out of hand. Nobody on purpose built a slow website. Nobody on purpose loaded their front end with a million different tracking scripts. It usually happens because people aren't keeping an eye on this stuff. A client got in touch with me earlier this year saying, hey, Harry, I think we've got a problem with third-party performance. And I replied saying, look, I've seen it all before. Nothing scares me. Just send it over and we'll see what we're working with. And this one actually did scare me because this one was pretty bad. And what I realized is that most of the time, third-party performance is just a case of a disconnect. Because your dev environment and your prod environment are very different beasts. They look very different. So when you're working on your dev environment, you probably don't have your tag manager. You don't have your analytics running. You won't have your ad networks and your A-B testing tools. So as a developer, you see this kind of view. You see that, well, this is the website I built. I did this this week, and this is nice and fast. Then it goes live, and all of a sudden, the analytics gets turned on. The A-B testing tool gets turned on. Your tag manager gets turned on. And what you think you built and what we send to the user 
end up being two very, very different things indeed. And this is purely a disconnect. This is because a lot of third-party assets, a lot of third-party scripts, completely circumvent the developer lifecycle. A third-party tag manager gets involved and just starts injecting all of this crap. The, red, uh, sorry, the green is what the developer built. The red is what we sent to customers. This is an e-commerce client, so they're not users, they're customers. They're people who give us money. But that red is all tracking scripts. It's nasty kind of spying kind of things. It's analytics, it's retargeting. It's disrespect. As of 2015, 18% of British people still have a pay-as-you-go phone, right? They don't have a phone contract. They're literally paying for every kilobyte of data we send them. That red is disrespect. So this talk is going to be condensed into a really short amount of time. I could do a full day workshop on third party performance. Over the next sort of 30 minutes, we're going to break it into four main sections. One, understand the risk that third parties present. Two, audit and measure them. Three, the most difficult bit is discussing them. Discussing third party performance with the third party provider and discussing it with your marketing team and the people who are implementing them. And finally, a brief section on starting to mitigate these things. How do we design around these vulnerabilities? So one, right, let's understand how can third parties affect us? And the answer is in many, many different ways. The first way that I'm going to spend the least time on, because it's the thing I know least about, is simply security. Every third party asset is you effectively inviting an unknown person into your domain, right? You're inviting them into your house. You don't know who they are. You don't necessarily know if you can trust them. If a third party is being simply sent over an insecure connection, you're going to start to get things like mixed content warnings. And that, at the most basic level, will start to erode trust. As soon as a customer sees an insecure content warning on a website, you're already beginning to sacrifice trust. But if those assets are insecure, there's every chance they could get compromised. They could be man in the middle. You could be actually serving compromised third parties unwittingly to your customers. Um, and then the last point, people don't think about this. What if the third party is just a bad actor? What if there is just a scumbaggy third party? And that absolutely can happen. I was flying to Iceland last year, and uh, I always pay for the in-flight Wi-Fi because I'm a mug, I'm a sucker, and I can't believe that in-flight Wi-Fi exists, so I buy it every time. Um, but this was a period when my site could be accessed over either a secure or insecure connection. So on an insecure connection, Iceland Air were man-in-the-middling me. You can see up here, they were managed to, managing to drop their own content onto my web page. Not only were they man-in-the-middling me and serving me ads and sort of like marketing messages, they were downgrading my connection to HTTP 1.0. My site over a secure connection runs over H2. It's nice and fast. But their proxy server, whatever it is, was forwarding on an H1.0 connection. Huge performance impact there. However, it can get more nefarious. Uh, YouTube were busted last year serving compromised third-party ads that were running crypto miners on people's machines. Uh, YouTube was recently caught displaying ads that covertly leech off visitors' CPU and electricity in order to generate digital currency on behalf of anonymous attackers. Wow, right? This recently happened with government websites. Um, a third-party script got compromised, uh, and nearly every government and official kind of university website in the UK was running a crypto miner. So at the very minimum, make sure all of your third parties are pulling their assets from a secure origin. The clue is in the name. You just want secure things. You would never want anything insecure. However, there are performance benefits to this as well, because as soon as you have TLS enabled, you get access to new web platform features such as H2, Service Worker, and Brotly. These are specific performance advancements that are only available over a secure connection. The next problem is delays, and you don't need me to tell a room full of engineers that you know, time is money and delays are bad for business. Um, but delays could take a number of different forms. You could have network delays between first and third parties. What if the downlink is pretty slow? What if there is a high level of latency, which means network negotiation is quite high, DNS, TCP, TLS? What if third party infrastructure is suffering delays? What happens if your, um, CM, uh, sorry, your CDN is getting DDoSed? What happens if your font provider currently has an outage? Then there's the more subtle cost that people don't really consider at all. What about runtime performance? What if there isn't an outage? What if the network is running smoothly, but the JavaScript that the third party has sent you is layout thrashing, causing a lot of jank? What if it's expensive and an optimized code? Uh, this is me quoting a client, quoting a third party provider. So there's a client of mine, a guy called Ryan Townsend. He's the CTO of a very performance conscious e-commerce startup in Leeds, where I'm from. And he was concerned that one of his third-party providers was slowing the site down. So he got on a phone call with them. And he said, look, I'm concerned that your script is slowing the site down. 
And the, the provider said back to him, oh, there is zero performance overhead to using our synchronous script. The typical response time is around 200 milliseconds. My first thought is, well, pick one. Is it zero or is it 200 milliseconds? And the second thing is, in web performance terms, 200 milliseconds is a long, 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 long time. That's non-trivial. Trainline, a client of mine, they found out by reducing latency by 300 milliseconds, they made an extra 8.1 million pounds every year. Proportionately, that 200 milliseconds is worth 5.4 million pounds to someone like Trainline. Mobify found that every 100 millisecond decrease in load time raised them an extra $376,000 a year. So 200 milliseconds, over three quarters of a million dollars a year. My favorite one, and this next one is staggering, is uh, Walmart. Walmart found for every 100 milliseconds improvement they made, that could lead to a 1% increase in revenue. Walmart is enormous. So 100 milliseconds is 1%, 200 milliseconds, 2% 2 increase in revenue purely of their e-commerce sales means that 200 milliseconds is worth $230 million a year to someone like Walmart. That 200 milliseconds doesn't seem so much like zero anymore. Now, that's a slowdown. That's a delay. What happens if we go nuclear? What happens in the worst case scenario that we've got a single point of failure? What happens if that third party is critical to rendering your page and that third party has a full outage? This is worst case scenario, and this can happen to a lot of websites. A client of mine, sky.com, oh, this is terrible. You can't see the most important bit. OK, you'll have to look at the slides. What's happened here is I visited sky.com. We've made a secure connection to sky.com. We've managed to connect. What you unfortunately can't see is the tab in Chrome's title bar, the, like, the actual tab, is just displaying HTTPS sky.com. It's not given any kind of title text in the browser. And that's because we've got a third party just in front of the title tag. I'll probably increase the font size in a second, I think. This third-party JavaScript is a parser and render-blocking script that sits on the critical path, and it's had an outage. This means that Chrome's parser has got to line 9, which is the script, but because that script is having an outage, it's disappeared, it cannot progress to line 11. It can't even show a user the title of the tab. 100% of the HTML payload made it to the browser. There's enough content that the user should be able to see something, but because we've got a third-party outage, this script here that says pending, it's just timing out. What's going to happen is Chrome will wait till its built-in network timeout fires after 1.3 minutes, and then it will proceed to render the rest of the page. Unfortunately, all the critical information is chopped off of this, because what's going to happen after 80 seconds is the browser finally gives up looking for this script, and then it shows the user a page. But for that full 80 seconds, we saw a blank screen, and we didn't even manage to see any text in Chrome's title bar, right? because the script was in front of that title tag simplest, tiniest fix here is just swap those two lines around. Make sure your title tag is the first thing in the head so that even if you do have a critical outage, you can still respond with some user feedback. Now, this problem isn't specific to JavaScript, and it's not specific to Adobe Tag Manager. It's not Adobe Tag Manager's fault. Oh, you can finally see here, load time, 1.3 minutes. If you just do link well equal style sheet fonts.googleapis.com and they have an outage, the exact same thing will happen to you. So it isn't specific to Adobe Tag Manager or JavaScript. And I'm willing to bet that 90% of the developers in this room have at some point done link well equal style sheet fonts.googleapis.com. That kind of naive way of linking to third party resources leaves you susceptible to these kind of problems. So these are the kind of risks we face. How do we go about measuring them? You know, we need to measure these things so we can fully understand what we're dealing with. So I'm going to go through some quick tips, some things that I do to help me measure third party performance. The very first thing I do is a very non-scientific, light touch assessment of the general overhead and impact. Everybody grab hold of your phones. You need to take a picture of the next slide. But the first thing I do is a really quick sweep of the general third party situation. And I do that using this tool, requestmap.webperf.tools. We will come back to this in two slides time, but we need to do a little bit of preparation work first. But what this tool does is it will take a URL and it will give you a spider diagram of all the third party origins that page goes to. In order to effectively use this tool, the first thing I do is I then turn to web page test. Web page test is a phenomenal resource. You just pass it a URL and it will run some performance statistics over that page. Uh, what you can see up there is the, um, this unique ID that web page test gives us. What we're going to do is we're going to grab the ID and later we're going to feed it into request mapper. Uh, the slides are already online, so don't panic too much. This is quite hard to follow along with, I guess, when it's static. 
Um, but what you do is request map.webperftools slash render slash that unique ID. And what that will do is it will grab the, uh, the data from the web page test, and it will give us this. My clients and I have lovingly called this the jellyfish. This is a data viz of all the third-party assets this page goes to. The size of a blob represents the number of kilobytes from that domain. The distance between the blobs represents the average time to first byte between those domains. And the thickness of the lines represents the number of requests between those domains. This is nice for kind of marketing people. This is nice for kind of non-technical audiences because they can quickly see the problem. This is CNN, and CNN has kind of a third-party problem. But as engineers, we need to be a bit more forensic. So what we are interested in is this bit here, download CSV data. And that's going to give us this, a really rich jump, uh, dump of data containing all of the types of resources, the types of provider, their name, and the performance information related to them. Now, don't laugh at me because I don't write much orc at all, but I cobble together this one liner. And what I do is I just run this one liner across this CSV file, and it will strip out every third party domain. It will strip out just the domain name from this entire CSV file, and it gives me a list of every third party domain on that page. The next thing I do is I go back to web page test, and they've got this amazing block feature. And what I can do now is I can rerun the test and block all of these third parties. So what I can do is have a before, which is a test with every third party enabled, and then an after with all of those domains disabled. This gives me some really simple basic information as to how the website performs with and without third parties. This data isn't yet very useful, but what it does allow me to do is generally assess if there is a problem with third parties. With CNN, turns out the load time is well over twice as slow if all third parties are enabled. What this tells me is that these third parties aren't downloaded at the load event, they're downloaded before it, and they push it back. If there are any key metrics or key events that um, there's an event handler waiting for the page's load event, these third parties are pushing that event back. However, what is kind of good news is that we'll see that start render and speed index, two very kind of user experience metrics, these are largely unaffected. So I can see that, OK, the, the load time does get pushed back, but we're not giving the user a blank screen. At least we can show them some content quite early. However, if we were to look at the number of requests, we have 4.2 times more requests going out if we have all these third parties enabled. This means that by far the vast majority of assets on this page were for third party content. And the worst thing here is users don't like third party content. Users don't want your analytics. They don't want to be tracked around the web. 4.2 times more data was sent over the wire just to spy on our customers. If we look at the actual page weight, we'll see that 2.7 times more kilobytes were sent over the wire by having third parties enabled. I'm in Serbia right now. I had to buy a SIM card to, to use data here. I spent about 15 euro on 7 gig of data, or whatever it was. I probably got ripped off because data is so expensive when you have to buy it, like pay as you go. But this means that every single time I visit a web page, it's eating into my 15 euro. It's eating into my 7 gig allowance. This is literally costing me money to download your tracking scripts. This is very extreme and non-scientific, though. This is just a general idea of, look what happens if we remove all third parties. What I start doing next is identifying single bad actors, specific domains, specific uh, providers that are worse than others. So what happens if we've got a slow origin? We talked about delays earlier. How do we test what delays affect us or how they affect us? What happens if type gets running slowly? What happens if Maximizer is running slowly? What happens if um, live chat is running slowly? It's a really great question to ask, and thankfully, it's a really easy question to answer. There's a tool called Charles Proxy. Anybody used Charles before? Anybody used Charles? A couple of people. Charles Proxy is free in the same way that Sublime Text is free. You're like, yeah, sure, I'll register that tomorrow. Uh, Charles Proxy is a really powerful tool for basically proxying network traffic, but the favorite, my favorite feature is that you can begin to slow down individual domains. So you know, you've got Chrome's dev tools. You can slow down your entire web page to like a 3G connection. With Charles, you can slow down just one domain. So you could say, well, let my site run normally, but maybe make my CDN run over a 3G connection. Make Google Fonts run over a 2G connection. This allows me to assess that kind of 200 millisecond problem that my friend Ryan had. Let's go a step further. Rather than delays, let's talk about outages. What happens if a third party goes offline? What happens if um, Google Fonts goes missing? What happens if Typekit completely goes offline? They're getting DDoSed. They've gone down. Again, a really important question to ask, and thankfully, a very simple question to answer. Web page tests make available a black hole server. This is a server through which all traffic just goes missing. Now, we can easily kind of work out the IP address of that server, 
what you can do in your hosts file is just map interesting third parties against this IP address. What this means is that locally, Twitter, Facebook, and Google Fonts are all going to get tunneled through an outage server. So I can start to see what happens if a third party goes offline. This is exactly how I spoofed these tests earlier. Google Fonts didn't actually have an outage when I took this screenshot. This is me stress testing things locally to identify the risk introduced by having critical third parties on different infrastructure. Now, there's a subtle difference between an outage and like a 404, because an outage will wait 80 seconds before it times out, whereas a 404 returns immediately. So what happens if a file just goes missing? What happens if a file isn't present? This is a thing that we don't think about very often. We tend to just assume everything will always work normally, but it's a very important thing to think about when we discuss resilience. Performance and resilience are pretty much the same thing. In fact, resilience covers things like security, performance, etc. cetera. Um, the way I test this is usually around JavaScript frameworks. A friend of mine six years ago now said that all your users are non-JS users while they are downloading your JavaScript. This is completely true. Even if they've got JavaScript enabled, until that JavaScript has arrived and correctly executed, they're effectively a non-JS user. I've got a semi-controversial opinion. It's not controversial anymore, I guess, but never optimize for users with JavaScript disabled. If a user has turned JavaScript off, they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were getting into. So don't build websites for people who turn JavaScript off. However, what we need to consider is, how well does our JavaScript fail? How well does the site respond to the JavaScript having a critical error? Or uh, an ad blocker strips out your vendor.js by accident, right? An overzealous ad blocker removes your, your framework. This could happen. In fact, in 2011, so kind of a long time ago now, but in 2011, there was a really interesting thing happened to T-Mobile customers. T-Mobile and a lot of other network providers proxy the content that you are viewing. If it's over an insecure connection, they will look at the image you're viewing, put it through their servers, and think, this image hasn't been optimized. I'll optimize it for them and pass it along. So what they're doing is kind of nice. They're doing a good thing. But they can be overzealous. What they'll do is they'll, they'll look at an HTML file and see, oh, it hasn't been minified. I'll minify it for them and send it along. So in 2011, what happened is they were proxying jQuery millions of times through their servers. And they were a bit naive. They just looked for a slash star and thought, oh, somebody's left a comment in this JavaScript file. I will start deleting. However, in jQuery, it wasn't a comment. It was a string. It was a regular expression, slash star. But T-Mobile just started deleting. And they never found a closing star slash. So they basically deleted two thirds of jQuery and thought, well, that was very kind of us, optimizing this file for our users. Let's send it along. For several days, millions of websites were broken for tens of thousands of customers. Now, this would be a solved problem if we used HTTPS everywhere, which we absolutely should be doing. But this is a scenario where, completely out of the developer's hands, certain files weren't turning up. Again, this is a really trivial and easy thing to test with modern tooling. This is a client of mine who's built a fully client-rendered JavaScript application. I wanted to work out what happens if, for some reason, vendor.js never makes it over the wire. In DevTools, right-click that file and block request URL. Reload the page, and it will just not request that file. It will show you what happens if that file doesn't make it. We didn't handle it very gracefully. We just showed an infinite loading spinner. We can have some simple JavaScript in there that checks, hey, has the application bootstrapped yet? No, it hasn't. Then just say, hey, we're really sorry. Something has gone wrong. Try refreshing the page. Rather than showing an infinite loading spinner, we could respond to this better. The next thing that, again, people very rarely tend to think about is the runtime cost. So let's assume there isn't an outage. Let's assume there are no network delays. And let's assume that every file made it over the wire perfectly in time. What happens if the file that landed isn't very well optimized? What happens if the runtime cost of that file is very high? Now, one of my favorite things as a performance engineer is being able to blame somebody else, because it makes my life so much easier. And I still get to charge people for that. What we're going to do is run a performance profile on a certain web page. So in Chrome, go to the Performance panel, run a performance profile. At the bottom, you'll find a summary overview. I'll show you a screenshot of it in a second. But in the summary overview, you've got a thing called bottom-up. And then in bottom-up, you can group things by domain. Basically, what this is going to do, it'll look at the runtime cost of loading a web page and show you which were the most expensive domains involved. Now, this is a fully client-rendered JavaScript application. It stands to reason that the first party, sportsbet.io, is the most expensive runtime domain, because we're bootstrapping um, React and all of the stuff built on top of that. Okay, So it, this makes sense to me. I understand why we are the most expensive domain. However, we can, instead of grouping by domain, group by specific file. Something terrifying happened. Holy shit. Actually, it turns out Google Tag Manager has a higher runtime cost than all our 2.5 megabytes of decompressed 
client-side application. Our third-party tag manager is the single most expensive file on this page. That is worrying. This is a point of concern for me. The single most expensive thing on this page is a third party. Another really nice feature in here is that this view and this list of files updates in real time as you scrub across the, uh, the profile. What you can see is that Google Tag Manager kicks in really early on. And then it's a while before sportsbet.io becomes the most expensive domain. What this is telling me right now is that for some reason we are prior prioritizing third party content above first party. Simple fix here is defer the loading of your Tag Manager. Make sure you deal with first party application code first, and then load in your third parties, and then deal with that next. It's a very expensive thing to do to put third parties, uh, put them first. So next up, we move on to the discussion part of the process. And as a consultant, this is kind of, it's the bit that I do the most of, because <clears throat> I'm paid to have the awkward conversations that developers don't really want to have. And the discussion piece is by far the most difficult, because it deals with people, right? The tech is usually the easy bit. We can make things faster. It's very difficult to go to your marketing team and tell them that every single thing they do every single day makes the website worse, right? No one likes being told that. Normally, when I have these discussions with companies, you have to tread very carefully and be very aware of people's kind of egos and feelings, and that's completely fine. One of the first things clients always tell me when we discuss third parties is that it's a necessary evil. We don't really want to have this analytics software, but we kind of have to. I think this is the laziest answer I've ever heard, because you need to dissect both of these words. It's not as black and white as that. Is it, is it really necessary? Do we need three analytics packages? Do we really need a custom font? You know, we've designed a font that looks so much like um, a system font, can we just use system fonts? And also, we need to discuss evil. A crypto mining bit of JavaScript is pretty damn evil, but you know, is Google Fonts evil? I don't think it is. Is Google Analytics evil? Not necessarily. So to have this discussion around necessary evil is always kind of uh, smoke and mirrors, and it allows people to kind of forget the problem. So what I do is try and drill down, do we really need this thing? Is this thing critical to running our business? If the answer is yes, then that's fine. But if we can somehow replicate that functionality with a first party or avoid the functionality altogether because we don't use it that often, then we absolutely should. Now, discussing third party performance with providers is usually a little bit easier because you're usually spending money with them. So you've got a bit of weight. You've got a bit of kind of power at that table. Um, but one thing I would suggest is if you suspect a particular third party is affecting your performance, form a hypothesis. I think this file is bad. I think this third party provider is slow. But the second bit is the most important. It's gather data. Triple check that you are correct, because there's nothing more embarrassing than being on the phone to a third party provider saying, you're yeah, shit, and they tell you that actually you've just implemented it wrong. Or actually your own code is blocking our execution, right? So gather as much data as you can to make sure you're definitely correct, and then let them know. Just tell the third party provider that they are problematic. Now, this isn't always easy, and the way you do this will depend on your relationship with that third party. But one thing you could do, if it's a third party you spend lots of money with, just open a support ticket. Hey, we're a customer of yours. We've noticed you're slow down. Like, you're not very fast. Can you please look into it? If you spend a lot of money with them, you may even have a dedicated account manager. You may have someone you could actually call up and say, hey, look, can we get an engineer to look at this? But most of the time, third parties aren't someone we can get in touch with that easily. They may have an open source issue tracker somewhere. They may have a product forum where you can ask like, the community members, hey, has anyone fixed this performance issue? But usually, that's not always the case. So defer to point four. And I find this remarkably effective. Just send someone a tweet, especially when it's public complaints. They reply really quick. So um, my ad network was um, putting target blank on all of the ad network I use on my website. They were putting target blank on all of their links. Target blank poses both a security and a performance threat. So I just tweeted at them, hey, can you get your developers to put rel equals no opener on your links? A few weeks later, it was done. It was live. DHL were running an application uh, over secure and insecure origin. Like They could run it over both, but they weren't force redirecting any of their customers onto the secure application. This application was taking customer data insecurely. I tweeted at them, they, back, they put it on the backlog, it got fixed. Sometimes, though, it's even more obscure than that. It's kind of not the correct term, but a third party's third party, we'd call, normally call a fourth party and then a fifth party and so on. This was a fourth party. This was somebody whose my ad network was bringing them onto my site. This is the thing about third parties. You think you know who's turning up, but they can invite their friends, and they can invite their friends, and you end up like the Australian kid in a complete mess. So I just found out, oh, this ad network, Lotame, however it's pronounced, I just found them uh, on Twitter, sent them a message, 
And their CTO replied to me saying, hey, we'll look into this immediately. It got fixed. Now, it seems like a really trivial thing to do, but honestly, sending tweets is way better than sitting and doing nothing at all. Uh, it could actually have the, the change you're, you're wanting. OK, right, I need to really hurry up. Uh, internal teams, this is the hardest bit, discussing this with your marketing team, telling your marketing team what they're getting wrong. Um, and that's usually my job, to have these awkward discussions. And I've got some tools that I use to help me. Remember the CSV file we downloaded earlier from the little jellyfish? I've built a Google Sheet, because managers love spreadsheets, right? So give them a spreadsheet, they'll be happy. I've built a little Google Sheet, which will take all of the information in that CSV, and it will give me information about that third party. So yellow is a duplicate. If there is a yellow entry, it means there is more than one analytics provider, more than one ad tracking provider. Um, it also means that it could be more than one company, so we're using Twitter more than once. Red is severity. Graded from zero to the 90th percentile is a gradient of like white to red. Anything that's solid red is in your worst top 10% of offenders. These are the things we need to tackle first. I'll give you a link to this template in a couple of slides time, but all you need to do is take your CSV from the jellyfish, uh, import, or file, import, find the file on disk. Here's the key bit, replace data at selected cell. And here's me dropping CNN's website over the top of that template. So all you need to do when you've got the data there to start going having discussions with people about, hey, look, I did the hard work of finding out how many an analytics things we've got. Can we get rid of three of them, right? But the point here is ask, don't tell. Never turn up to a meeting with your marketing department saying, look how bad the website is, and it's your fault. Start by having a meeting with them by asking them questions, right? Gather the data, organize a meeting, ask questions, and learn. Understand why they use these third parties. Understand how we got so many of them. As soon as you go in all guns blazing, they're going to get defensive, and it won't be a very productive meeting. Quickly, folks, on the last one here, this is my favorite question. Are there any third parties we don't recognize? Nearly always, the answer is yes. Like, oh, never seen that before. Right, well, then we can probably get rid of it. If nobody here knows what it is, you can't be making any use of it. Let's get rid of it. Um, quickly take a picture of this slide, because I've got like negative minutes left now. Um, this is the template. This is the Google Sheet. So if you take a picture of that slide, you can get hold of that template. I'm going to really quickly go through the last few uh, bits of the talk. The last section is mitigation. We've learned about how third parties can affect us and what that means for our business, but how do we actually design around this? So I've got some quick tips you can start implementing immediately to start defending yourself. So first one, self-host wherever possible. Always try and control your own infrastructure. Even serving a third-party asset from a first-party domain is better than serving third-party stuff from a third-party domain. If you're first-party origin, your site is running smoothly, but you've got a third-party outage, that's really frustrating because you could operate normally, but a third party is preventing you from doing business. If you have an outage, you've got bigger things to worry about. So controlling your own infrastructure is a huge plus here. Um, another thing is we can start to provide our own caching headers. We can preload these things. We can have a more aggressive caching strategy if we uh, control those third parties. So always, where possible, self-host any critical assets. Try not to have a render blocking style sheet on somebody else's domain, because if they go offline, so do we. If you can't reliably self-host an asset, make sure you load it from somewhere else asynchronously. Try and avoid any synchronous loading of any critical assets. Uh, synchronous, blocking party, uh, synchronous or blocking third parties create a single point of failure. That's dangerous. Um, use any provided async method. If the third party doesn't provide an asynchronous loader, that is a red flag. Don't use that third party because they haven't considered the impact of them going offline. Never trust a third party that doesn't allow you to asynchronously load their assets. Turns out the fix for the sky problem was simple. We just need to asynchronously load this JavaScript file. That's all it took to fix this. Yeah, let's not block the parser, and if there is an outage, the user never knows about it, but if there isn't an outage, let's continue as we were. There's no point giving a user a blank screen for 1.3 minutes for the sake of getting analytics data. Because you're not going to capture the data anyway if there's an outage, right? There's no point blocking on this kind of file. Next thing, this is kind of oddly specific, but there's a relatively new platform feature called Resource Hints. And Resource Hints allows us to preemptively do things on the network. So Resource Hints, um, every trip to a new origin, a new domain, could incur some new network negotiation. DNS, TCP, TLS, potentially all three of them. We can tell the browser to solve this ahead of time. So what you need to do is look at your site, look at the front end, identify third parties. So here we've got font providers, analytics providers, search, uh, sorry, not search, uh, social widgets. 
identify those providers, look up their domains, stick this in your head tags. Has anybody seen pre-connect before? Anybody seen this before? A couple of people. Take a picture of this. This is nuts. Because what this will do is it will tell the browser, hey, soon I'm going to send you to Google Fonts. Soon I'm going to send you to Twitter. So please can you do me a favor and just look up the domains and open a connection to them ahead of time. The default behavior of the browser is to do all of that network negotiation just in time, immediately before the request is dispatched. This is very suboptimal. We're putting hundreds of milliseconds of delay directly in front of a specific file. By pre-connecting these domains, we can completely divorce that network negotiation. This has made the site hundreds of milliseconds faster just by adding single lines of HTML. This is huge. Never tell your clients exactly what you do for them, because if I just raised an invoice for a link rel equals pre-connect, I wouldn't get paid. All I do is tell them, oh, it's half a second faster now. My advice here is only warm up frequent and significant and known origins. Don't warm up an origin that you might hit. Don't warm up an origin that is a fourth party. Last thing, I promise. This is the most important tip in the whole talk. This is the most effective single thing you can do, but it's also by far the hardest, so I apologize. And it's just exercise restraint. The simplest single thing you can do when it comes to third party performance is just exercise some restraint. Get by for as long as you can using as little as possible, right? As little as possible for as long as possible. Try and avoid adding that second, fourth, tenth analytic software. Try not to go to five different font providers for rendering one single page. Try and make it a business objective to push back on third parties as much as you possibly can. This is the hardest one to achieve, but prevention is cheaper than the cure, right? If you can just avoid the problem for as long as possible, you're going to stay fast. Right, that was a real whirlwind tour. I'm 39 seconds over. Thank you very much for listening. Um, is there a Q&A or do I need, to, I need to get off stage now? Find me and we can do questions later. Anything you need to ask, anything you want to ask, I'm around all day, so come and find me. Thank you.